as Bipolar Barbie. So what I do is I'm a mental health advocate, I'm a motivational speaker, um, I write, I have a lot of blogs, my Instagram, Facebook, YouTube channels. I'm really about expressing myself and documenting my life with mental illness. People ask me what are your qualifications and it's quite simple, lived experience. I got sick of seeing everyone else's highlight reel on their Facebook account. I got sick of being on my bathroom floor, so depressed, contemplating suicide, flicking through other people's photos about how happy they were in their lives. It wasn't real and I knew that it was fake but it still got to me. So I decided to take a stand against that. What I decided to do was post my daily bed selfies when I was too depressed to get out of bed or um, post the, the, you know, <laughs> the freak outs I would have when I tried to organize to go out with friends and I'd have a panic anxiety attack before I walked out the door. And I would document those moments and post them online. In the last probably nine months, my Instagram now has over 35,000 followers. Um, my Facebook is getting up there as well and my YouTube is just blowing up. So that's really exciting. And I think it was probably about six months ago now I met my first fan. And I know that sounds a little bit crazy, but this girl, she was probably a few years younger than me. She was just staring at me in the shopping center. She wouldn't break her gaze with me until she started screaming, oh my God, it's you, it's you. This poor girl was crazy crying, she was in hysterics, she was screaming, and I thought, oh my god, it's One Direction here. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and you know, we met, we, we had a conversation, we hugged, and she just said to me, she said, because of you, I'm taking my medication again. Because of you, I can express to my mother how I feel, and she's helping me get the help that I need for the illnesses that I suffer. And that really touched my heart. For me, that is the the best feeling that I could ever get in the world and it made everything that I have been through worth it in that moment because it meant it was going to help other people so I guess when did I know that I was mentally ill I don't think it's anything you kind of just suddenly wake up one day and go I'm, I'm mentally ill um, it's kind of when you get to a point in your life where you feel like you're standing in the middle of a tsunami and you're like how the hell did this happen? All the mess is around you, there's rubble, it's just total life destruction. And you're like, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. That was past Jess. I don't know what she was thinking about. It's like not being in control of who you are. I guess that's where <coughs> the name Bipolar Barbie came from as well. Um, one of my housemates said to me, why do you have so many clothes? And I said, well, I've got so many different personalities. They each need their own wardrobe. And then I thought of a, a Barbie doll, you know, how Barbie has her nurse Barbie. She's got all the different outfits, Dr. Barbie, wedding Barbie, rollerblading Barbie. Well, I was a lot like that, except there was depressed Barbie, anxious Barbie, suicidal Barbie, borderline personality disorder Barbie, bipolar Barbie, um, manic Barbie, and any, any other mood state you could imagine in between. I have been diagnosed with five mental illnesses. Oh, the joys. <laughs> People say to me, oh, you have bipolar, it's like you're riding a roller coaster. But I mean, with the other four in play, it's like I'm riding five roller coasters at the same time, all going in different directions and just intertwining. I have not had more than a month of stable mood in the past six years. And that month is now. Starting four weeks ago, I managed to find relief from a really long six-month depression. Um, my bipolar disorder is seasonal affective, so I tend to spend nine months of the year in depression and nine months of the year in such an elevated mood state, it's like I'm off my face on cocaine. I can't function. I don't sleep. I don't need to eat. I'm just running around, I do stupid stuff, I get arrested, I jump out of moving cars. It's not good. So there's a lot of reasons I sought help for my mental health. Besides failing, you know, law school, um, art school. I mean, who knew an artist could fail art school? 
um, you know, I, I guess in the past six years, I've had over like 40 different jobs. It's been the last 18 months. I've lived in 13 different houses. I spend about four months of the year in the psych ward. So it's safe to say I'm qualified to talk about mental illness and depression. What is depression like? Depression is a living hell. It's like you've just been dropped into this hole and you don't know how to get out of it. You don't even know where to begin climbing out of it. And every time you do try and climb out of that hole, you just fall back down again and you'll climb and you'll fall and you'll do that thousands of times before you come to the conclusion that I can't do this on my own. It's not something I can just will away. It's not how other people think of it. Like people say to me all the time, if you just stop telling yourself that you're mentally ill, you just won't be mentally ill anymore. And I respond to them. If I just told you that you didn't have a broken leg, would you not have a broken leg anymore? Like you can't get rid of a mental illness in the same way you couldn't a physical illness. Um, I think depression to me is a lot of darkness. It's a lot of just black. My moods as an artist come to me in sort of in visions, in pictures. When I first became mentally ill, when I was at law school, I had no idea what the hell was going on. I felt like I'd just been dropped in the middle of the ocean and there was no one around. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why I was feeling like this. And I didn't, I guess it never occurred to me that I might be mentally ill because it's one of those things they, they bring awareness about, but it's always like those people over there that are mentally ill, you know, that'll never happen to me. And they don't explain what it would be like if it did happen to you. So I'm drowning in the middle of the ocean. I don't know what's going on. All I know is I'm not in Kansas anymore. So I'm sitting there and I start reaching out to my friends and my, my family because I think, you know, if someone I knew felt like this, I'd want to know. So then I, you know, I reach out to, I think my parents was probably the first one and the friends around me and I simply got the response, well, you'll be all right. Don't worry about it. Just try and put a smile on your face. You'll get there. And then it eventually turns into, if you don't have anything positive to say, please stop calling us. And I think that was the hardest part for me. I started self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, just anything to numb the pain that I felt. I was just trying to find relief. And I just really didn't know where to turn for that relief. And the people I did turn to weren't really there for me. And I think <coughs> people often ask me the question now, what made you ask for help again and again and again? Because I mean, my first GP, didn't really do anything, told me to see a counsellor. My second GP put me on an antidepressant and told me to see a counsellor. I think it was about 30 GPs later before I finally got to a psychiatrist. Um, he was all right at first, but because of the Australian healthcare system that you have, um, they're about $350 a visit. So for someone with no financial support out of work, that is really hard. For someone who is depressed that can't get out of their bed like this weight that's just crushing down on them <coughs> i mean it's only been probably three weeks since i've started answering my phone again <laughs> and you might laugh at that and see it as something so simple but that is what what is the hardest bit about depression is it takes away all of your functioning there is nothing that you can do and people say to me oh how great it must be to not work and just you know, lie in bed all day and watch Netflix or, you know, watch movies. And I say, in those times, I am so unwell that my mere presence on this earth pains me. There is nothing that I want to do more than just disappear into a blob on the floor, just melt. I just want to be as small and insignificant as possible. Because anything that I do, any attempt to live my life or be alive is like sandpaper rubbing against my skin. So I take the path of least resistance. Not because I haven't tried to take the path of resistance, but you know, I've just been smashed down on my bum. Um, and I think the hardest bit for me was having to go through all of that on my own. I mean, my story, 
is, is so difficult and so intricate, but unfortunately it's all too common. Um, I used to look back and be quite angry at all the people I turned to and weren't there for me. I mean, I still see it from people people today. Oh, you don't need medication. You just need to like think happier and you'll be fine. I mean, five different types of medication, three different types of mood stabilizers, antipsychotic, hormone medication. Um, you know, it's it's been such a long process. There is no one cure for depression, particularly biological depression or people that have, you know, sort of a bipolar or a, a different depression component. Um, I've tried 17 different depression medications. All of them might work for a little bit, they might not work at all. You've got to be on them for at least three months until you get to the point where, you know, they're not working and then they go, all right, we'll try something else. Basically, I'm a lab rat and they experiment on me. But the difference between me and a lab rat is that a lab rat is in a carefully monitored box. I'm just thrown out into the world and expected to live to take care of myself, to be an adult, to pay bills, to try and keep a job, to try and function. And I think a lot of people see it as an all or nothing approach. They're like, oh, well, you're not depressed right now, therefore you can function. No, um, just like in depression, there's many different levels of depression from mildly depressed to uh, moderately depressed, severely depressed, all the way down to being absolutely suicidal. And I can tell you, you know, this, this last six months has been a very severe depressive episode. Um, but I was working for a little bit of that. Um, and people said to me, yeah, but you were depressed last month and you were working then and now you're depressed. So why can't you work now? Well, I was less depressed then than I am now. It's kind of, it goes down on a slope until you hit absolute rock bottom. And when people say to me, depression is all in your head, I kind of think, well, of course it is. It affects your brain. Your brain is the control center for your entire body. So it makes sense that if your brain isn't working, the rest of your body isn't working either. You're going to be either eating too much, not eating enough, um, your anxiety. I mean, my heart rate um, from a generalized anxiety condition that I have, my resting heart rate is 135 beats per minute. Now it should be probably about 80, maybe 90 for someone my size. So I'm constantly running a marathon every second of every day before I even do anything. So no wonder I'm having mood fluctuations between extremely exhausted and highly energized and, and, and everywhere in between. It really does affect my whole entire body. And sure, I go through a lot of therapy and work on my thought challenging and things like that. Um, suicidal thoughts has been a really big thing for me. I've tried to kill myself a few times. Um, I'm not proud of admitting it, but I think when you when you're in that mindset, you know, people say to me, "How could you even fathom giving up the life that you could have?" And I'm like, "No, I'm ending my suffering." Even when I feel good right now, you think about it. I've probably had, say, a couple of good months a year for the past six to eight years. So the majority of my life I spend in this absolute living hell. I mean, wouldn't you want that to end? Um, last year, I kind of, in the year before, I, I spent a lot of time abusing drugs and alcohol, basically to numb that pain because I woke up every day with one thought on my mind. Today is the day. I'm going to kill myself today. And I didn't particularly want that to happen, but I just couldn't, I couldn't bear to spend another day alive. I just couldn't do it. So I would numb that pain. But at the same time, who knew that you could feel the most immense pain you've ever felt in your life and numb all at the same time? It's really just confusing as hell. Um, and I never really thought of myself sort of suicidal until probably my first suicide attempt. And when someone explained to me the difference between sort of being suicidal and suicidal thoughts, I actually realized that I'd been suicidal my whole entire life. It's not normal to fantasize about death. It's not normal to um, play out how every single person in your life that you care about is going to die. Or it's not normal to play out how you are going to die over and over again because death would be a relief. So that would actually be something that you enjoy. And on the other hand, you have these sort of death, death orientated thoughts and fantasies because you feel like you're in so much pain. 
like you are grieving the person that you once were and that overwhelming pain and agony and fear and, and, and anger and hatred, you just don't know why it's there. So you create little movies in your head as to why that would be there. If someone I cared about died, it would make sense that I feel like this because we're all just trying to make sense of it. And when people sort of say to me, you know, you can't really blame us for not being there because we didn't really know how to be there. We didn't really know what to do. And I kind of just think that's a pretty poor excuse. But I reply to them, I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what, how to get better. And I really was just scratching my head going, how do I get out of this hole I fell in? And I understand that other people wouldn't know what to do and they wouldn't, wouldn't know how to help me. But it would have been nice if we could have figured that out together. So I didn't have to do it on my own. 